uh, once my thing works. Um, so, uh, first, a bit of a background, why, uh, why this matters and why I'm talking to you about this topic. Uh, piece of bad news, uh, AngularJS is going to end its long-term support uh, in July 2021. Uh, we're kind of one or three years into, uh, into this long-term support period right now, so before that expires, I think any sensible developer who still wants to have support for the uh, stuff he's using would probably consider either you know, migrating for, uh, to React or Vue or some other framework, or at the very least consider a migration from AngularJS to, uh, to Angular, the latest version of Angular. Um, as it turns out, a migration from AngularJS to Angular is going to be very difficult. Uh, the official guide uh, for migrations already state uh, up front that you have got to learn TypeScript, and if, got, if, you've been lear if you have been learning JavaScript, uh, using JavaScript this entire time, you'll probably find that to be a bit of a pain. Um, on top of that, um, the guide also says that you, uh, it's best if you actually rewrite a lot of your AngularJS parts into either directives or components, uh, just to better fit in with uh, Angular's uh, philosoph uh, uh, philosophy and architecture, which basically centers around building a front-end application using a component hierarchy. So uh, whichever, uh, whichever way you decide to go, uh, either migrating to uh, React View or migrating to, to Angular, you're probably going to have to do a rewrite of some sort, or at least a very, very invasive change. So, uh, rewrites. You can either re uh, release a rewrite every, uh, all in one go, or you can do a, a rewrite incrementally. I think most people in this room would probably uh, intuitively know that migrating to uh, my migrating your application all in one go is inherently risky, so I'm not going to add very much up here, except to say that uh, the British bank TSB tried to do exactly that uh, some time ago, and they were rewarded with 10 weeks worth of IT outages. I don't think you want that. So um, migrations tend to be less risky if you, are, uh, if you do them incrementally. And uh, they also have this other nice side effect to it. You can actually perform your uh, incremental migration while you're still delivering features for your client, while, while you're doing uh, all, bits of, uh, all other bits of important work that you might, uh, you might need to do in your, uh, in your course of work. In the context of front ends, um, you can do your front end migration uh, one of two ways. Uh, you could start at the fringes of your application. Uh, start, just start with the simplest, uh, start most self-contained components, and then slowly work your way up, um, building around, uh, you know, building on top of that until you uh, get to the point where you can cleanly replace your framework and uh, and all the like data, um, uh, the the bits that kind of inject data into your components all in one go, and then uh, replace Angular JS with uh, React. Or you could start off replacing. Uh, AngularJS with React from the get-go, and then mount all your legacy AngularJS components onto the new thing. And then from there, you have the luxury of time to actually work your way down the application out to the fringes, uh, ending off with the, uh, with, the, uh, with the simpler stuff. So uh, turns out uh, this, uh, this, pat this pattern of in incremental migration actually has a name. Uh, it's known as the Strangler pattern. Um, so the term is con uh, coined by Martin Fowler, uh, from ThoughtWorks, and it basically, uh, basically the name is derived from strangler fig trees, of which we get a few in Singapore. Now, strangler fig trees basically grow by planting itself onto a host tree. Uh, over time, that, uh, that the strangler tree actually grows uh, larger and larger. It will start uh, taking, uh, directing resources away from the host tree, and over time, uh, as it outcompletes the host tree for resources, uh, the strangler will basically kill the host, uh, host tree, leaving the strangler standing. So in a similar vein, uh, the strangler pattern kind of works by injecting uh, a new component or new module into an application, and uh, and you then the developer will then start directing data flow and uh, maybe uh, maybe user interactions towards this new module on top of the legacy application. Over time, uh, you basically build around that new component, uh, and it grows and grows, directing more and more data and more and more user interaction away from the legacy application until you can actually safely decommission the old part, leaving the new application standing in its own right. Cool. Uh, so with all that in mind, I'm going to just talk a bit about some of the common patterns and techniques we're going to be using to perform the migration. So um, all the, the, what I'm about to tell you guys basically work on a very, uh, very important premise. Uh, whether, it, uh, whether it's AngularJS, whether it's Ang uh, the latest Angular or Vue or React, they kind of work on they kind of work by basically manipulating elements in the DOM and rendering their content onto that. So ostensibly, if you can actually just expose a single element for, uh, for your UI framework to work on, if, uh, it could just bootstrap itself onto that and uh, it can go off to do its own thing. Uh, or to rephrase uh, what I just said, if one framework can actually expose a DOM element to another framework to mount itself on, uh, onto, 
you can actually have the two frameworks coexisting peacefully with each other, and uh, that will give you the basis to actually uh, perform your incremental migration. So um, if you look at the slide here, right, um, whether it's Vue, whether it's React, whether it's even AngularJS, they basically work off the same premise. You uh, basically tell it to bootstrap itself by giving the uh, giving some blurb, which were, uh, which is the application template, uh, and you also uh, identify the element that you want uh, the framework to render. So uh, you want the framework to render onto. Cool. Uh, for the next few slides, I've actually prepared some code pens, uh, uh, which you can then access using QR codes there. So if you want to follow along, scan the QR code, and uh, and you'll be able to see a fuller example of uh, of what I'm talking about. So let's dive right in. Um, AngularJS uh, components and directives typically expose the element that they are mounted onto using uh, the variable known as dollar element. So, uh, so for mounting React and Vue onto AngularJS is uh, pretty straightforward. What you do is you take dollar element and then you tell React, uh, React to basically render itself onto uh, onto dollar element just like that, and uh, you you already have uh, React mounted mounted on top of AngularJS in this example. Of course, uh, you kind of want it, uh, want this rendering to happen all the time. Uh, particular, uh, in particular, uh, whenever the AngularJS component changes its state, so you basically have to hook up the render method uh, onto the on changes callback. So uh, the other way around, mounting AngularJS onto uh, Vue or React, uh, it's somewhat more involved. So I'm going to try to break it down for you guys over the next few slides. Uh, the first thing you have to do is to basically specify uh, the AngularJS view as raw HTML. You then inject this raw HTML into your uh, into your host component. Uh, in the case of uh, React, unfortunately, it, you have to use the dangerous this thing called dangerously set in the HTML. Uh, and and so uh, once you do that, uh, your AngularJS uh, view will be will be found within uh, within the host uh, component. Uh, once that's done, you have to expose a reference. Uh, uh, or rather, you have to, uh, you basically have to ex uh, expose the a reference uh, to the component template uh, such that it's actually accessible programmatically within uh, within the controller part of your uh, of your uh, React component in this case. Um, and once you have all that, um, what you do is that during uh, during the bootstrapping phase of your Sorry, during the mounting phase uh, of your React component, uh, you basically instruct Angular to be to uh, to bootstrap itself onto the element reference that you've kind of exposed programmatically. So uh, with, uh, once that happens, then you basically have uh, AngularJS daytime picker mounted onto a React component. In this particular example, um, cool. So why isn't everybody trying to do uh, incremental migration from uh, AngularJS to React or Vue? Turns out there are Quite a number of pitfalls uh, that are, uh, that come with trying to do something like this. So I'm just going to go through a few uh, a few of these problems. So uh, let's talk about React directly. Um, React is kind of distinct from say Vue or, or Angular in that uh, it kind of enforces one way data binding. That is, uh, any data that you find within a component cannot be uh, cannot propagate to the rest of the app, uh, to the rest of the application. Everything basically has to go uh, one way down. So uh, that's very distinct from uh, AngularJS, uh, which kind of supports two-way data binding. So, uh, one, uh, so one of the things that you have to kind of account for is uh, trying to rewrite parts of your AngularJS application such that they, uh, it understands that notion of using callbacks to propagate uh, changes in your, uh, in your data to the rest of your application. So um, more generally speaking, um, I think I'm not, uh, I'm not sure whether you guys uh, kind of noticed, but but in effect, every time you host uh, Angular JS onto uh, onto React or, or the other way around, you're in uh, in effect initializing a new application onto uh, onto your pre-existing um, uh, pre-existing uh, application that's hosting it. So um, in this in, in this particular uh, case you have here, uh, you have a React application be, uh, hosting uh, Angular JS components uh, at the leaves. Uh, each single AngularJS component is actually an uh, AngularJS application in its own right, which also means that they probably don't realize that, uh, that, uh, that, um, that the other components exist. And if your AngularJS application kind of centers around um, event subscription and uh, event subscriptions, you uh, you might actually have uh, you might actually have problems. So uh, when you're doing something like this, you probably might have to in introduce uh, other means to try to pass uh, pass your events around either through Introducing a third-party message bus, or through uh, through the use of callbacks again. 
So yeah, that's something you can take, take into account. Uh, there are a whole bunch of other problems that, I've, uh, that I probably won't be able to cover during the scope of this talk, but I'll just quickly cover them. Uh, firstly, React Router is not Angular UI Router, so uh, React Router kind of works off the basis of URLs, uh, whereas uh, uh, Angular UI Router is basically a pure play state-based router. Um, in addition, you also have to consider the fact that you're trying to run two frameworks in one application, so the memory uh, footprint would, uh, would significantly change, so you have to plan for that accordingly. So, um, maybe to just wrap up like everything I've said so far, I'm going to talk about why this uh, matters to us at Open Government Products. Uh, form SG is something that we kind of built. It was a government form builder for, uh, uh, used, for pub, uh, used by public servants. Uh, it's kind of gained very widespread adoption by, uh, by many government agencies, and uh, as a result, that, uh, that kind of led to two things. One, a lot of our uh, engineering time is actually spent uh, delivering features rather than actually dealing with uh, engineering, uh, engineering work. Uh, also, uh, stability is actually, actually becomes a concern because you, you, you now have this popular thing that uh, all the public servants are trying to use and you have to make sure that they can go about doing their work without any, uh, without any disruption. So, uh, the, having said all that, FormSG is also based off an open source project that kind of used AngularJS as its, uh, its, as its front end. And uh, even if we were to just uh, continue using AngularJS, uh, that would uh, that framework is actually starting to uh, get in the way of us delivering features, and and um, it's quite frankly quite uh, quite complicated to work around. So, uh, with all that in mind, uh, we have to try to figure out how we can actually uh, continue uh, maintaining Form SG and to uh, to migrate away from Angular JS uh, before uh, before the long term long term support uh, period kind of runs out. And an incremental migration would be al would allow us to continue to do all. Uh, Will con allow us to do all that while uh, still uh, allowing us uh, time to actually deliver features. So there's a lot more I kind of want to say about this topic, but um, I don't think I have enough time, so I'll just kind of uh, kind of uh, put all the rest of the content into a, into a blog article, which you can scan. QR codes here, uh, and yeah, if you have any questions, um, you can feel uh, feel free to to, to uh, look for me after this. Uh, so I guess that's it for now. My name is Alvin. I'm a software engineer uh, for Open Government Products. Uh, thanks for uh, thanks for all your time. Thank you. The fact that component uh, components in AngularJS kind of only came about after version 1.4 of AngularJS. Uh, yeah, but uh, what what did you do? In, you, in here you wrap the you wrap the dome of the Angular component and yeah. the React yeah. component. Yeah. But actually, in, in Angular, there is like a lot of concept that yeah, maybe correct. So you've got this notion of controllers and yeah, views, like, right? Yeah, for example, like okay. five directives. So I just want, you just want to know how can you migrate them from React. That's I understand. A very different concept. Sure. Cool. So uh, the question is, um, what do you do with uh, with uh, given the fact that the uh, that the official guide kind of talks about like migrating Angular JS components uh, from uh, uh, from uh, from Angular JS to Angular? Uh, how do you square that with the general uh, the general notion of Angular JS, which kind of centers around controllers, uh, controllers and views and everything else? So, um, given the fact that a directive and a component in and of itself is basically a self-contained thing containing a controller and a view and stuff like that, uh, I think uh, my own experience working uh, uh, w trying to do some, uh, migrations like this actually in, uh, was quite okay. So I was actually able to. Uh, to stuff the AngularJS controller and the accompanying views uh, into the React component itself, and then I just I, I just work, uh, work my way from there. Um, so your other question relates to uh, the cost of the rewriting the application and refactor the application. Right. Um, so I think what I didn't cover in my slides was that uh, for, for mis, um, not only was FormSG using uh, AngularJS. Um, the growth of the Angular uh, of the Angular JS front end kind of ca came about somewhat organically. So um, I think a lot of the arguments that I've been having with the uh, with my colleagues uh, over over how we should approach this migration said, uh, actually seem to favor uh, have uh, refactoring our application first, such that it's a little bit more maintainable, and then considering the uh, doing the, the the one for one migration from Angular JS to uh, to the more modern framework. I think. That's probably a bet, uh, that's probably a good approach to to do it because it allows you to get a good sense of how uh, how things actually work within your front end before you actually do the translation. Right? So at least that gives you a bit of a guide before you, you carry on. But hey, I'm a back end developer. What do I know?
There's a concept called the microprint. Again, it is from yes. the microprint. Yes. So they talk about almost the same thing. Uh, we, 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 it, has, it has side effects. Yes, it does. How long it takes? How long does it take for the refactoring? Uh, we're still in the argument phase, so I'm afraid I won't. I, I can't give you an ETA right now. Okay. Hi. Uh, uh, please, have you ever considered like migrating more on a route basis? Because I think it's like moving from one framework to another is mm. really really drastic. Yes. Um, I suppose that can be done. Uh, so, hmm. so you, what you're basically saying is, uh, depending on which route, uh, which which route of your UI uh, the user selects, it might render as a React uh, React yeah. application or as a so a page basis. Yeah. I mean, definitely you'll break the. I mean, you'll break the SPA experience. With, like, I mean, I, I see. Yeah, I understand now. But yeah. at least you know it's more. Yeah, that can be done. I see, um, the, I, I see the, I understand the, the strangler pattern. Sure. But I also see that, you know, it, it can kind of makes the code uh, messy. Yeah, you're basically maintain, you're basically having to maintain one code, code base and getting your head around two different uh, frameworks with two fundamentally different philosophies uh, yeah. in, one, in one go. That, that I agree with you. Uh, but as you've pointed out, if you're going to do uh, go the root based route, you end up having two Different, uh, two different code bases supporting. Uh, I don't know which route until the user, uh, 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 until I inspect the config to go figure out which uh, which bundle to serve. So, um, yeah, pluses and minuses and, and, and associated trade trade off Yeah, I, I think that uh, I think what you suggest is a complete a completely different approach as well. Yeah. Hi, Carlo. I mean, the big question is: Are you able to make it like full migration within a two sprint? No, you don't do that. You do incremental migration. There's a reason why I did incremental migrations, right? You want to do a big bang, you end up like TSB. Yeah. So, so it's like like you involve a few sprints around. Yeah. So so that, that that's kind of yeah. So that's kind of the basis of it, right? You uh, plan uh, with incremental migrations. You can basically stretch the, the entire paying of the of the technical debt across multiple sprints, and uh, yeah, that's that's uh, that's that gives you some uh, a fair bit of flexibility. As an engineer, the 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 are you asking me to say a preference for frameworks? Uh, I mean, do you, you know, as a public servant, I need to be known. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, at, at this point, since our industry kind of moved from 30 check to assembly engine to, to state components, but I'm wondering if at this point of time, since we're still running all of them, mm. um, like which one makes more sense? Um, I really cannot comment. Uh, th I, I think this is this is kind of beyond my uh, my experience as a front end uh, as a f pretending to be a front end developer. So yeah. Uh, but if you ask me to choose between frameworks, I will use uh, Vue.js to uh, for simpler stuff because uh, and uh, when something goes too big, then I'll, I'll, I might actually consider switching to using React. So I think we should call it here. Yeah. Any more questions?